Hey everyone, so again, Priyak here with another MCAT question of the day, and this is also a great way for you, today at least, to learn a bit of chemistry. So, because today's question is about chemistry, so let's go straight into it. It says, under what conditions does a gas behave most ideally? Um, and, you know, the answer choices are just basically different permutations of high slash low temperature and high slash low pressure. And this is actually a very common question. It's not a unique question. It's not something I had to think very hard to come up with because I know a lot of professors ask this question and a lot of high school teachers ask this question. And the reason they ask it is because it, it, it tests your understanding of ga ideal gases without necessarily asking you to plug it into formula. So here, we need to not only know what an ideal gas is, but also understand the principles that govern that govern ideal gases. So that's why I think this is a very common question. So this question actually tests your um, understanding understanding of ideal gases without formulas. Remember, you guys, you most students are used to getting tested on uh, on ideal gases versus with the PV equals NRT formula. But in this case, we don't even need to use that. We're getting asked a conceptual question, which, uh, believe it or not, are tend to be a bit more difficult than the formula questions. So with that said, let's move on to this lower half where it says ideal gases all follow what? What do all ideal gases follow? You might be tempted to say PV equals NRT because we, that is the formula. But believe it or not, that's not what I'm going for here. The thing that I want to know is ideal gases all follow the kinetic, let's see if you guys know what I'm talking about, kinetic molecular theory of gases. So um, yes, all ideal gases also do follow PV equals NRT, right? But P the PV equals NRT that we're so used to seeing on tests is all derived from the kinetic molecular theory. If the assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory of gases are true, then PV equals NRT will work, okay? So with that being said, let's move on. Um, so what is the kinetic molecular theory? It's a set of assumptions you need to make to call a gas ideal, okay? Um, we are always go around throwing the term ideal gas, but there are a certain number of assumptions that are always made when you call a gas ideal. And now, what exactly do you mean by ideal? Well, when I say a gas is ideal, it can be examined using the formula that we've already just talked about, PV equals NRT, okay? But if you don't know the gas is ideal, you cannot use this formula. You can only use this formula if a gas is ideal, okay? So what is the assumptions of the kinetic molecular theory? And so if you don't know them already, you should probably get these ingrained in your head. So the first, um, the number one thing is that Assuming this gas is ideal, then we have to assume that the collection of particles are in constant motion. This often means they're moving sh in straight lines. It often means that they're consistently moving. We're all used to this. This is actually an assumption that is, part, is pretty much true for all real gases as well. So this is not something we're too worried about because this is something that happens in all gases. The second thing is there are no attractions or repulsions between particles and the collisions are like billiard ball collisions. What do I mean by billiard ball collisions? Billiard ball collisions are elastic. Elastic collisions are where kinetic energy is conserved. And what I mean by that is you don't lose any kinetic energy when these two gas molecules collide. You know, if one's going 25 miles an hour and it stops when it hits another one, then the other one that gets, uh, that gets hit is going to start going 25 miles an hour, uh, assuming they have the same mass. And um, if kinetic energy is concerned, the other thing that's also concerned in elastic collision is momentum. I'm not, I don't even know how to spell momentum, so I'm going to abbreviate it M-O-M. -M. Momentum is conserved, and momentum is the, the, uh, the product of mass times velocity, okay? Mass times velocity is momentum. So believe it or not, this assumption number two is actually the one that does not really apply to real gases. Number one actually does apply to real gases because, you know, gas molecules are usually in motion. They're usually in constant motion. But number two is the one that is going to give us problems because real gases, let's think of something like uh, ammonia, right? If we had a gas bag of ammonia, right? Ammonia, that three looks horrible. Ammonia, uh, then look at this Lewis Dahl structure of ammonia. It's this, right? And this, the dipole is basically pretty much like this way. But now, if you had a bag of ammonia, then 
you have a delta negative here and a delta positive near the hydrogens, right? Delta positive near the hydrogens. So now when ammonia is moving around, one molecule of ammonia will usually be attracted to another part of the ammonia molecule, right? Like if I had another molecule, the delta positive, the delta negative here will attract to the delta positive on the hydrogens, right? So the point is that this no attraction solves no repulsions is something that's pretty ideal. It's not something that will happen to real gases, but you know, if we assume that there are no attractions, then we can assume it's ideal. But most gases that are real will have some amount of attraction slash repulsion. All right. With that being said, let's move on to number three. It says a lot of space between the particles compared to the size of the particles themselves. So what does that mean? Basically, what I'm saying is that the volume of the particles, which I've abbreviated V particles here in the lower left corner, is zero, right? So if you had a whole Coke bottle, right, and it was obviously empty, right, this is my lovely Coke bottle, uh, and you had a gas in it, what you can assume is that the volume of the Coke bottle, usually volume Coke bottles are what, two liters? You can assume that the volume is still going to stay two liters because the volume that the... Um, uh, the volume that the gases add on is pretty much zero, right? If they add in zero liters, then the overall volume is still two liters. So the point is, compared to the overall size of the Coke bottles, the particles themselves and the space between them are so small that they're negligible. Their volume is negligible. Okay, so now, what's the last thing? It says the speed uh, that the particles move increases with increasing temperature. This is something that should intuitively make sense to a lot of you. And it applies to most real gases, even ideal, most real gases, let alone just ideal gases, because, as you know, let's say we had a bag um, of uh, gas at 30 degrees Celsius. Right? If you had a bag of a gas at 30 degrees Celsius and you had a, the same bag of gas at 100 degrees Celsius, you would expect that the molecules at the 100 degrees are moving much faster because look, they're in such a hot environment. Right? right? If you've ever been on a playground, this is kind of comparable or comparable to when the, the floor of a playground heats up. And if the floor is very, very hot, you're, you find yourself moving around a lot more because you can't stay in one place for too long. Whereas if the floor is not as warm, you can actually move around and not be as antsy, right? So this is something that I think is intuitive. So now let's move on to the fourth page. And assuming, remember we talked about all four of these conditions. And I made sure to make tell you all that number two was the one that is a big assumption. It's a very, very big assumption. Like number one, number two, number, number, number one, number three, and number four are pretty much like common knowledge right this like it applies to real gases and ideal gases and so you might think that number one three and four are not that big of a deal and they're not they're 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 big parts of the theory but they're not too big of a deal but number two is the one where man we might be stretching it a bit if we try to apply that to real gases because most real gases do have intermolecular forces but let's say it's an ideal gas if it's an ideal gas then it's going to have no intermolecular forces, right? So an, a gas is ideal if it minimizes intermolecular forces. If it minimizes intermolecular forces, it's going to be an ideal gas, right? So that brings up the question, how do we minimize intermolecular forces? So this, will, this is the point of this slide. It says to minimize these under intermolecular forces, molecules should be, uh, there are two, time, two ways to minimize intermolecular forces. And you can kind of relate these to yourself. So pretend like you have 30 students on a playground, right? I'm going to use the playground analogies today. If you have 30 students in a playground, how do you minimize all the students clumping up together? How do you minimize all the students from clumping up together? Because remember, we want to make sure these intermolecular forces are minimized. So you want to make sure all the students are spread apart. Well, the best way is the first condition, which is moving fast right? Assuming everyone is moving stat moving fast, right? Like, let's just say, like, these are students, right? If they're, like, congested like this, you have a lot of intermolecular forces because there are a lot of students in one area. But let's say they're moving fast. Like, this guy's going this way, this guy's going this way, this person's going this way, and they're all moving very fast. That's going to minimize any chance of anyone getting really close to one another because they're consistently moving. But on top of that, there's another way we can minimize intermolecular forces, and that's to have everyone spread apart, right? 
if we have everyone moving fast and spread apart on a playground, they'll be not clumped together. We will not have this situation that I've drawn. Instead, we'll have this situation where everyone's moving very, very quickly. This will make the gas ideal. So, how can we do that? How can we have someone moving fast and spread apart? Well, now let's relate this back to our kinetic molecular theory. When do gases move fast? How do gases move fast? Remember, according to the kinetic molecular theory, gases move fast when the temperature is high. Right? Remember that? The fourth condition of the kinetic molecular theory was high temperature. And now let's examine the second condition. When are gases most spread apart? Well, for this, let me give you the classic piston example. So this right here is a piston, right? A piston, and underneath it is a gas, right? Let's say we have six molecules of a gas. Those are very small molecules, but there are six, right? So that's the piston, and there's a certain amount of um, spread that these gas molecules have, right? But now let's say I make the piston go down. If I push the piston down, those same six molecules now have much less space and are less spread out, right? Less spread out. And if they're less spread out, they now have more intermolecular attractions, right? So what separates this, condition one, where you have much more spread out gas molecules than condition two? Well, the thing that separates it is that condition one actually has um, lower pressure, right? Lower pressure is the main thing that separates one and two. Because one is very low pressure, but then suddenly, bam, two comes along, we're congesting everything in a much smaller space, there's much more force per unit area, and so now you have much higher pressure. So gases are most spread out under low pressures. And with that, we've actually figured out the answer to this question. Under what condition does a gas behave most ideally? And according to our aforementioned analysis, it is under high temperature and low pressure. So. The answer is high temperature and low pressure, which is A, all right? The answer is A. All right, thanks for watching the video. Give it a big thumbs up, like it, uh, share it, subscribe. It would mean the world to me, and I'll see you guys in the next one.